Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association. Making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, a meticulous pile of records presented in the Menendez trial today connecting Nadine Menendez, halal meat owner Will Hanna, Egyptian officials with the paper trail leading to the senior senator himself. Plus, just across the street, it's judgment day for the former president. The jury in the Trump hush money trial begins to determine his fate. But if, if he's elected president, you know, all bets are off. You have no idea how that's going to how that's going to go forward. So a little bit of unbroken ground here. Also, protecting democracy. Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill taking on the Supreme Court demanding ethics reform. I think we need a, an investigative body to um, investigate some of the charges and weigh in on them. And calls again in Jersey City for a mental health crisis response program nearly a year after Andrew Washington was shot and killed there by police and two years after first promised. We have to mobilize, we have to advocate for persons with mental health challenges and also with addiction challenges. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Wednesday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Prosecutors are methodically building their case against indicted U.S. Senator Bob Menendez. As the trial resumed today, attorneys presented jurors with a catalog of texts, emails, photos, and other phone records, all meant to showcase the relationship between the senior senator, his indicted wife, and the co-defendants from whom they allegedly accepted bribes. Portraying Nadine Menendez as the gatekeeper who arranged lucrative meetings with her powerful husband and Egyptian officials. All to secure a halal meat export monopoly that benefited their friend and, in turn, helped the Menendezes get rich. The allegations that Senator Menendez acted as an unregistered foreign agent to Egypt are arguably the most damning, but prosecutors still have a ways to go in proving the scheme. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has been in the Manhattan federal courtroom all day and joins me now with the latest. Bren, good to see you. So, wow, a lot to sift through today for the jury. What happened? Well, hey, Brianna, hours spent, the prosecution had an FBI agent on the stand, and he was going through email after text message after voice recording, essentially laying out three main stories for the jury here. And obviously, they're doing it in chronological, chronological order, hoping that the jury can connect the events together. So what did they start with? In 2018, Nadine Arslanian, who is... Senator Menendez's wife, when she was still the girlfriend, uh, essentially helps arrange several meetings between Senator Menendez, Egyptian officials, and her friend Will Hanna. And they're supposed to be discussing, you know, friendly relationships between the U.S. and Egypt. But by July, Menendez texts Nadine, and this is what he tells her, tell Will I'm going to sign off on this sale to Egypt today. And he lists $99 million worth of tank ammunition, tens of thousands of rounds of tank ammunition. Now, Nadine texts this information to Will Hanna. Will Hanna texts the information to Egyptian officials. The Egyptian official texts Will's, Will back a big thumbs up. Now, obviously, the Egyptian officials were very happy, and they're hoping the jury makes those connections. So it's Brie. like a, a game of telephone, it, it looks like here, when it comes to this Egypt-focused uh, alleged plot. It, do they make Nadine the linchpin here? What else did they present? 
they did make her the linchpin. What happens next, narrative number two, is Will Hanna gets a lucrative monopoly on certifying U.S. halal meat uh, in, in the U.S., sales of U.S. meat to Egypt. Now, there were seven companies that were doing that with no problem, but apparently Egyptian officials arranged a meeting via Nadine with Will Hanna behind the back of, of, of the USDA, the Agriculture Department, and they decided to bestow this monopoly on Will Hanna. Very, very lucrative, worth a ton of money. They canceled the other contracts with those seven companies, completely blindsided them. This is, uh, as the story unfolds, you get pictures of, of Nadine, and she complains, for example, that Will Hanna is not delivering on any of his promises, and these promises apparently included a car. They included a carpet. They included a job, possibly. And there's an email that uh, this group sends to each other, knowing, acknowledging that Nadine is critical it, it, to gain access to Senator Menendez, because it says, and I'm quoting, okay. it's important to keep Nadine happy, because if she's not, she'll cancel the meetings that will set up with Senator Menendez. So, so the prosecution is really this, laying think, her out to be critical to tying these relationships together. Uh, very quickly, Bren, any other bits of evidence presented here through this litany of communications? Well, I mean, it, it became obvious that uh, there's a, a relationship that develops between um, Nadine and Bob Menendez. They keep referring to each other with French endearments. Uh, you know, je t'aime mon amour de la vie. I love you, you know, love of my life. Uh, but this this testimony, this this grinding chronology is, is going to continue tomorrow as they try, uh, the prosecution tries to convince the jury of, of what happened. Kudos on your French there, Bren. Uh, thanks so much. We will be back there again tomorrow. Brenda Flanagan for us. Meanwhile, just across the street in Lower Manhattan, another court case has been overshadowing the senior senator as a jury deliberates in the first ever trial against a former U.S. president, deciding whether Donald Trump is guilty of 34 felony charges for allegedly falsifying business records to hide that he reimbursed his one-time fixer, Michael Cohen, for paying off adult film star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 elections, who prosecutors say took the money and exchange for staying quiet about an affair Daniel said she had with Trump. Deliberations come after marathon closing arguments and weeks of explosive testimony describing tabloid deals and claims of conspiracy. For more on what this historic decision could mean, I'm joined by former federal prosecutor Chris Gramiccio. Chris, good to see you. Typically, we're talking all things Menendez, not the case today. This trial has been really prosecution driven. Did the defense do enough to make their case in what was 10 hours of closing arguments? It, that's the $20 million question. And anybody who tells you that they can predict what the jury is going to do, I'm sure they got a bridge to sell you in Arizona. So um, it, it's just impossible to kind of predict what a, a randomly selected jury from a cross section of New York citizens will do. And there's also a lot that we're not privy to. I mean, and we're just following along in the media as, as we can, but they are privy to the evidence that was submitted. They are privy to the jury instructions. So it is impossible to tell. But as like I always say, if you're a defense attorney, it only takes one to hang a case. So we'll see. Yeah, and of course, the judge specifically instructed these jurors not to base their decision off of Michael Cohen's testimony um, alone. Uh, uh, a big moment there. What happens, though, if there is a guilty verdict? Is jail time a possibility for a former American president? So again, not to be the one without answers, jail time is a possibility for anyone convicted under the, the felony version of that statute. Uh, the question whether any defendant, much less a former sitting president and a current Republican candidate for president, is going to get it is entirely another thing. Um, we're talking about like uncharted waters here. Uh, it's a complete unknown. Um, but thankfully, we still have to see if the verdict will return, um, you know, favorably for the state or otherwise. Uh, so, Chris, uh, is there grounds for appeal from Mr. Trump's team based on uh, everything that's been presented? I, I think so. And I, I think in following along, I think so as well. Every time you hear the defense attorney make an objection, um, what they're doing is they're making a record of trial 
So if there is a conviction, it goes up on appeal, you have to preserve issues for appeal. If you, if you don't object to them, the only way you can have them looked at in an appellate court is if what's called plain error exists. But if you lodge an objection, you're basically signaling to the appellate court, this is a legal problem and we're reserving any and all rights we might have on appeal with it. So throughout the trial, you've seen them do that. It's, it's a bit of a strategy to decide how much or how little to object because it tends to drag out the proceeding and, and annoy the jury a little bit, but you do have to make a record as an attorney. Um, so they've, they've tried to walk that line. This, of course, is one of four cases against Mr. Trump. Is there anything that we should draw from this uh, as we look to the future uh, and beyond the election for what we might expect in the other cases? Well, I, it's really difficult to compare it to the others because um, the, the one down in Atlanta is obviously a different state jurisdiction, and then the other two are federal cases. Um, I, I, I think a lot of us that were following these cases against the former president thought that this would be the last case to go forward in New York, but because of uh, other you know issues in those three other trials, it, this this is the one that's presented that's been presented first. Um, so I, I I tell you it's it's difficult. Would if if there is a conviction, um, he would still have to ultimately face trial in those other trials. Um, but if if he's elected president, you know all bets are off. You have no idea how that's gonna how that's gonna go forward. So. A little bit of unbroken ground here. Uh, no doubt about that. Uh, monumental decision uh, awaits. Uh, Chris Carmiccioni joining us. Thank you so much for your time. The U.S. Supreme Court is also weighing major cases tied to Donald Trump revolving around the 2020 election and the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. In a rare move today, Justice Samuel Alito issued a letter rejecting calls to step aside from cases involving the former president, despite a controversy that's dogged him for days about political flags flown over his homes. That was one topic brought up during an event today hosted by Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill and Maryland Representative Jamie Raskin about defending democracy. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports. For the Supreme Court, it's a law into itself, so it, it violates that first Madisonian principle, which is that no one should be a, jo a judge in his or her own case. Maryland Congressman Jamie Raskin, referencing the former president and namesake of the town he visited today, joining Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill in Madison for a conversation about ethics in the U.S. Supreme Court. Why couldn't the other seven justices issue a writ of mandamus to Justices Alito and Thomas to do the right thing and recuse themselves from these cases. Raskin and Cheryl have joined a growing chorus of voices calling for U.S. Supreme Court Justices Clarence Thomas and New Jersey native Justice Samuel Alito to recuse themselves from former President Donald Trump's Supreme Court cases after reports that Justice Thomas accepted gifts and vacations from a GOP donor without disclosing them and Justice Alito's New Jersey residence and vacation home had to stop the steel flag and a Christian nationalist flag flown outside. Obviously, the Supreme Court has not done well at policing itself when we see someone like Justice Thomas, for example, receiving uh, money from a large Republican donor. New details emerged this weekend disproving Justice Alito's response to the flags flown outside his home, which he had said was in response to an argument with a neighbor. Representative Raskin says that reasoning wouldn't matter even if it were true. If it were in response to a fight, it would obviously make no difference. I mean, a, a judge is bound by the canons of ethics and judicial impartiality and objectivity, regardless of what people around him are saying. Chief Justice Roberts said when he was doing his confirmation hearing that a judge should be like an umpire. Well, what, what happens if the umpire is flying the flag of a baseball team that's in the World Series? Everybody would understand that umpire is no longer impartial and can't be trusted to call balls and strikes in an objective in fair way, and that's really where we are today. At the event today was the family of Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick, who was killed on January 6, 2021. They too are calling for recusal. You can't tell me that they're not compromised people and they should not be serving on the Supreme Court, never mind on cases related to Trump. But Justice Alito issued a statement to lawmakers in a letter today saying he will not recuse himself from cases involving the 2020 presidential election or January 6, 2021, because the incidents with the flag 
eggs do not meet the conditions for recusal. Alito putting all the blame on his wife, saying, my wife is fond of flying flags. My wife was solely responsible for having flagpoles put up at our residence and vacation home and has flown a wide variety of flags over the years. Congresswoman Cheryl has co-sponsored the Supreme Court Ethics Act, which would create a code of conduct for all U.S. justices, including the U.S. Supreme Court, which currently has none. I think we need a, an investigative body to um, investigate some of the charges and weigh in on them. It's not enough that in their own minds they feel as if they're being impartial. They need to exhibit that in every aspect of their life. Cheryl's bill has been introduced in the House of Representatives, but doesn't have much chance of moving forward without the support of the GOP. The we reached out to each of New Jersey's GOP representatives in the House. None responded in time for this story. In Madison, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. Well, more than two years after it was first promised, Jersey City leaders have yet to deliver a program advocates say would be critical in crisis situations. Establishing a mental health team where experts in the field are paired with police officers when responding to those calls. The group Jersey City Together is calling on local officials to finalize the plan, telling Melissa Rose Cooper if it were in place a year ago, the program would have saved lives. We remember Rodney King in Los Angeles, the beating that he endured. We remember many others, but George Floyd was a flashpoint that then said, we have to mobilize, we have to advocate for persons with mental health challenges and also with addiction challenges. And now four years after George Floyd's death, Members of Jersey City Together are renewing calls for Jersey City leaders to create a mental health crisis response program. We had already made the Public Health Public Safety Committee to kind of work on neighborhood issues, gun violence, and things that were really afflicting our city. What happened then with George Floyd, we really embraced the idea of retraining, working with police to get the proper training, to co-train with behavioral health specialists so together they could be the response team. The need for the program hitting even closer to home after Jersey City Police shot and killed Andrew Washington while responding to a mental health crisis last year. We all know and understand that mental health is a real thing. We need to destigmatize individuals who are dealing with mental health issues. We don't need to be you know, throwing them to the wolves. The city council previously approved a mental health crisis response program, but last year rejected a $4.2 million deal that would have allowed Jersey City Medical Center to operate it. But it was only for five days and only for eight hours a day. Um, and we know, know and understand that mental health episodes don't have timing on it. In fact, when uh, Drew Washington was killed. It was on a Sunday, I believe. Now the city council is working on a new request for a proposal that would offer mental health services around the clock. But some people believe the process is taking too long. The city council is taking its time as far as developing, uh, you know, the, the RFP, what that plan would look like. Um, so while this is, while dealing with mental health is a complex issue, uh, generating this plan shouldn't necessarily be all that complex. I mean, you know, the urgency is now, and I would hope that the city council and the officials, you know, do something to speed that process up. I don't want to do something just for the sake of saying that we've done something, right? And then two, timing is very important. We know and understand that the nuances to these type of programs are very intricate, right? And we want to make sure we have the most comprehensive program that's available at our disposal. Um, so that's what we're doing. Like while we want to take our time, we don't want to move at sort of speed. We do want to do our due diligence, making sure, again, we create a, a good comprehensive program, but we don't want to move at sort of speed. We don't want another individual losing their lives because we didn't have set resources lined up for them to take advantage of. The state of New Jersey has its own response program known as Arrive Together. Now operating in all 21 counties, mental health professionals are paired with plainclothed officers when responding to mental health calls. A spokesperson for the state attorney general's office, which heads Arrive Together, says they're looking forward to partnering with Jersey City to discuss how to implement similar mental health services there. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper.
Increased traffic, air pollution and environmental damage are among the reasons a group of activists were protesting last night, rallying against the proposed widening project of the New Jersey Turnpike in Hudson County. The group in Power NJ organized the demonstration prior to the Turnpike Authority's open house on the first phase of the project. Critics say the estimated $10 billion it'll cost would be better spent elsewhere, while transportation officials argue the current infrastructure can't handle modern-day traffic. Ted Goldberg reports. As the New Jersey Turnpike Authority seeks a major reconstruction project in North Jersey, opponents in Bayonne argued against it, just before the authority hosted an open information session. What we're going to see is a, se a severe impact to our streets. We're going to see an endangered um, community that will suffer from, it, from using our streets. It is going to disproportionately affect low-income communities and people of color the most, and that we are being used as sacrifices. The Turnpike Authority is pursuing a $10 billion project that would widen parts of this eight-mile stretch of highway and replace 29 bridges. Some actually protested in song. We don't want while others were a little more direct with their language. This is a travesty of justice that must be stopped now. Hoboken mayor and congressional candidate Robbie Bala railed against the Turnpike Authority and said people's homes could be at stake. It's going to result in what's called eminent domain, which is condemnation. They're going to displace, literally displace households, people, livelihood. These, these are the things that they have not told you. The Turnpike Authority disputes Bala's claims and says there will be zero residential displacements for the entire 8.1 mile program. There are no park takings as well. Uh, we do largely within our right of way as much as we can, maybe some small takings along a property line, uh, but no residential displacements. But supervising engineer Lisa Navarro did not rule out eminent domain entirely for seizing small portions of people's properties. Typically, we, we do good faith negotiations, and in my experience, um, we largely are able to reach resolution. Rare case, we do have eminent domain. The information session did not allow for questions from the general public. Its goal was to merely share information. One of the benefits from the Turnpike Authority is that the project will create 25,000 jobs, something that's interested organized labor and tradespeople. It's a tremendous uh, opportunity and businesses that are located in this area, because the Turnpike is going to work with our contractors, we want to utilize a lot of the low local businesses here. We will be putting a lot of uh, men, women, and minority tradespeople to work, especially hopefully from Bayonne, Jersey City, and, and Newark. One of the 29 bridges addressed by this project is the Newark Bay Bridge. The Turnpike Authority says it's too old to be continually patched up. If you've lived in Bayonne as long as I have, you will always have memories of just sitting in traffic on that bridge. Some argue why widen parts of the Turnpike if the Holland Tunnel isn't getting wider. A traffic analysis report prepared by the Turnpike Authority says the program's enhancements do not address demand for additional trips to Lower Manhattan, but rather accommodate the growing local neighborhoods, communities, and port facilities in areas such as Bayonne, Port Jersey, Jersey City, and Hoboken. While Bayonne Mayor Jimmy Davis approves of the project, Jersey City's mayor and city council unanimously don't. If they were doing this for Jersey City, they would listen to Jersey City. And Jersey City has said, invest in mass transit. So if every single elected leader from all different political persuasions, if all of us can agree that this is a mistake and we should be investing in mass transit, you're clearly not doing this for us. The entire project is scheduled to take 17 years, and a replacement for the Newark Bay Bridge may not be open until 2031. Another public information session is scheduled for Jersey City later this year, where the Turnpike Authority should once again get an earful. In Bayonne, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News.
In our Spotlight on Business report, it's been a busy week for New Jersey's budding offshore wind sector. First on Thursday, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management released the final environmental impact statement for Atlantic Shore South. It's a project that calls for up to 200 turbines about nine miles offshore between Atlantic City and Barnegat Light. It's on track to be the state's first offshore wind farm, but the report found Atlantic Shore South could have major impacts on critical endangered North Atlantic right whales and the fishing industry, which may affect the agency's final decision on approving the project expected in July. Then yesterday, the Murphy administration announced it reached a $125 million settlement with the Danish energy giant Orsted. It's over last fall's scrapped offshore wind projects, which is less than half of what Orsted guaranteed to the state if the development fell through, which it did. But it heads off what could have been a lengthy legal fight. Turning to Wall Street, stocks dipped into the red today following a spike in Treasury yields. Here's where the market's closed. That does it for us tonight, but make sure you tune in to Chatbox with David Cruz tomorrow night. He talks to Representative Rob Menendez and Hoboken Mayor Ravi Bala, the Democrats vying for the 8th Congressional District nomination. They'll square off on the top issues facing New Jersey and the nation. That's 6 p.m. Thursday on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire NJ Spotlight News team, thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSCG Foundation. I'm Gloria Monks, 2024 president of New Jersey Realtors. Whether it's guiding first-time buyers through the home buying process or securing space for small business owners, New Jersey Realtors have been helping their clients through real estate transactions for more than a century. No matter what your unique needs are, there is a knowledgeable New Jersey Realtor for you. Learn more at njrealtor.com find.